let me begin by thanking Dr. Alec Gamer, my great help at the IPS, uh, Ravin uh, Ekanaka, uh, who has been my co-author as well on some papers on this topic, and I, IPS staff for giving me opportunity to talk on this important and timely topic. Uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity to address a very distinguished crowd. An armchair economic like me, get, uh, I mean, it is a rare opportunity to share ideas with high level policymakers. Therefore, I really appreciate uh, this opportunity. Yeah. Someone with a glowing introduction has raised your expectations, but I'm not quite sure whether I can uh, meet the expectation, but let me try. Why I decided to talk in this topic? Uh, in Sri Lanka, following the ending of the civil war, and in particularly after the change of regime, there is a big emphasis on export orientation, naturally because of the widening trade deficit. And uh, again, uh, given the employment implications of exports, government is placing emphasis on export expansion. However, in this debate, one important aspect of world trade, which is opening opportunities for countries to specialize in a finer international division of labor, which has implications for employment generation and poverty reduction, has been completely ignored so far. And we are not trying to learn from our past. And, uh, I adopted this sentence from a paper from Jagdish Bhagwati. Uh, global production sharing is the missing prince from the Sri Lankan Economic Summit, Hamlet. There was no single word about this very important development. Product space approach to policy advocacy is inconsistent, as I'm going to explain later, with the goal of uh, reaping gains from global integration through global production sharing. That is the key message I would like to deliver. I would like to structure my presentation in six sections. Since the topic is not familiar to most of you, I am going to start with a stage setting discussion about the basic concepts and the terminology uh, used in this uh, literature. Secondly, I am going to discuss uh, opportunities for export-oriented industrialization in the context of global production sharing. Then, uh, thirdly, some data to show how important this phenomena is. The point I'm going to make there is that there has been a palpable shift in world manufacturing trade from developed countries to developing countries. The dynamo behind that has been global production sharing. Then uh, I'm going to <coughs> talk a little bit about uh, Sri Lanka's role in production networks, uh, missed opportunities, and some promising signs. And uh, I'm lucky uh, today that uh, there's a very dynamic entrepreneur who has been doing well th in this area, uh, Mr. Rohan Palluwath, uh, the managing director of Sri Lanka Harness Limited, I think he knows more about this subject than me, and uh, I'd like to hear his opinion in the uh, discussion <laughs> session. Then I'll discuss policy options and end with a uh, few concluding remarks. By way of caveat, I would like to mention here, uh, this concept is relevant for service and trade as well, but given the time constraint, I am going to focus mostly on manufacturing. Uh, let me begin by introducing the concept, global production sharing and production networks. Always it is good to start with some picture. The picture can take a thousand words, right? Uh, I'm going to show you two pictures. The first one is Thailand-centered hard disk drive network. Secondly, Boyan 787 uh, Dreamline. Let us start with hard disk drive. Now, I particularly 
selected this uh, example because, an because of an important <coughs> reason. Think about the computer I am using. Maybe it assembled, that computer normally assembled in Pinan, but it is not a computer producing Pinan, right? Now, this computer has component coming from about 60 countries. Now, within the component, there is one component which is hard disk drive. Now, within hard disk drive, you can see the pattern of specialization. Uh, Thailand is the center of hard disk drive assembly in the world, right? But uh, Thailand is doing it, not, not own, by procuring components from more than 10 countries. Actually, the diagram is incomplete. There can be even more countries. Now, look at these few sentences. Hard disk drive export from Thailand, it got into data from uh, for 2013, is $18.5 billion. This single tiny component account for 15% of total merchandise export from Thailand, right? And Thailand assembles 70% of world has hard disk drive production in the world, right? Uh, but hard disk is not entirely made in Thailand. At least 10 other countries participate in the process. Now, the next example, here the, there are no developing countries involved in producing this uh, luxurious airliner 787. But still, I wanted to show this picture because there is a perception here that when you move up and produce sophisticated things, there will be greater value added in the country, per unit value added, and greater linkages. This is myth. Actually, linkages and value added were the con con concept introduced by Hirschman for the import substitution period. We are talking about a global economy where industries are globally integrating. I'm revisiting this sub point again at the end. Look at Dreamliner, and uh, even though you think that it's produced in the US, so many countries take part in the process. Uh, it involves 43 suppliers spread over 135 slides, sites around the world. Uh, wings come from Japan, engines come from UK and US, and so in the story. Now, compare the situation 60 years ago, when the first Boeing 707 Dreamliner was, airplane was produced, 99% of the components ori originated in the US. But now, uh, more than 70% of components come from other countries. In other words, industries are becoming internationalized. Naturally, linkages diminishes. Per unit value added, which accountants work very highly, is becoming irrelevant. What is important is the volume factor, right? Maybe the value addition is tiny, but you produce for a billion dollar market. Say, Ford automobile, and then uh, the famous Ford, who he used to, uh, uh, say that he had everything other than a rubber plantation uh, in his compound. But now Ford motor cars value addition, per unit value addition is only 30%, right? But the company is making profit because through globalization. Now, uh, with these two examples, I think it's easy for me to define what you mean by global production sharing. It is simply internationalization of the manufacturing process in which several countries participate in uh, different stages of the production process. Remember, in the tiny hard disk drive, there are 10 countries participating in it, right? In the literature, there are alternative terms for this subject, but I prefer the term global production sharing, a term introduced by management guru Peter Drucker, it gives nice idea about the whole process. But other alternative terms, you need to keep it in mind, different authors use them in different contexts. Uh, international production fragmentation, vertical specialization, slice in value chain, your offshoring, all these things imply the same thing. Now, the next concept I want to introduce is global production networks, which is simply 
interrelations <coughs> among the set of firm specialization in different segment of the production process. Uh, say, Intel Corporation has got seven uh, different subsidiaries in the uh, uh, Asian region. Now, interaction among them is the global production network. Then, in my presentation, I'm going to use the term GP and trade to mean trade within global production networks. Now, again, that's a misconception <coughs> that uh, global production sharing is basically a trade in part and component, which is not. GNP trade has two components. Firstly, part and component, and secondly, final assembly. Think about the uh, handphone, the iPhone you use. iPhone is assembled entirely in China, employing about 1.2 uh, million workers by a single company, Foxconn. But uh, iPhone embedded parts coming from other areas, right? Other countries. Therefore, to delineate global production network trade, you need to incorporate both part and component and final assembly. And then, again, there's a misconception that part and components are intermediate roles. They, you, people use the two terms as synonyms. But part and components are only a subset of intermediate goods. Uh, they are relation-specific intermediate goods. Always, you can't produce components and sell it on the <coughs> market, right? You need to have a link with the other company which are involved in the production network. In other words, they are not sold on commodity exchanges. Iron and steel <coughs> is an intermediate good, which is sold on commodity exchanges. But uh, you can't buy microprocessor just by going to a shop. It, it doesn't have a price. It has no relevance uh, as a traded good uh, on its own until it, is, it gets embedded in a computer, right? Then uh, network trade is more demanding on the contractual environment. Uh, Mr. Pallavate is selling uh, uh, the airbags, uh, airbag components to Toyota. But uh, he does it on the basis of a long-term contract he has established with them. Now, this is a very important point you have to keep it in mind. Uh, tax agents who try to uh, de uh, detect uh, transfer pricing might destroy entire companies because there are no prices. You need uh, formal relationship with the other parties and uh, therefore pricing might be different from case to case and the tax agent might go and detect them and the investor might even leave the country, right? Uh, this we need to keep it in mind. Then this difference between global production network versus global value chain. Even in the policy statement recently issued by the government, it misleading use the term global value chain to refer to everything, <coughs> right? It is not correct. Uh, so, uh, let me explain the difference between the two. Now, global production network I have already defined its in interrelation among firms specializing in different segments of the production <coughs> process of a given product, a manufacturing good. It focuses on vertically integrated global industries, manufacturing industry like uh, electronic, electrical good, automobile, surgical equipment, and so on. In other words, in a global production network, the it is driven by a lead firm, which is a manufacturer. Always in a global production network, global production network is built around a lead firm, who is always, which is always a manufacturing firm. The Intel Corporation <laughs> has got a network. Apple computer, uh, Apple uh, has got its own branch network and producing network. Therefore, it is producer center. The policy implication is that your promotion strategy need to be focused on basically key producers in holding the trade. Now, global value chain concept was introduced not by economists, by economic sociologists and political scientists. 
and uh, it is basically about the structure of governance among different parties involved in uh, the value chain from conception of a product until it goes to the final producer. It is not concerned with about the intricacies of the production process. And uh, say, uh, this concept is used mostly to primary product. Say, I have seen a lot of papers about cut flower value chain. Right? Then uh, there are many papers talking, talking about the Starbucks coffee. Uh, how coffee is produced, the role of the intermediate processing, and how it's go to consumers. And their focus is to find out who get the benefit, whether the producers are penalized, and all this story. These are two different things. If you are, if you want to promote uh, <coughs> the industry's involvement in global production network, you need to see the difference between the two. Here, global value chain is buyer driven. Uh, if you look at ready-made garment industry in Sri Lanka, you may not have heard the story. There was a key buyer, key, uh, the Martin Trust, who was the man behind the uh, rapid expansion of garment industry here, who came here, identified the talents of uh, Amalim Brothers for uh, Brandix uh, Asrop Oman, Oman, and they <coughs> place orders and it led to the expansion of a very successful high value, uh, not value added, high value ready-made garment industry here. They are the role of was the lead buyers uh, that played an important role, right? They are two different concepts. Then process of uh, global production sharing, I'm going to go through very quickly. This is not a new phenomenon. It has a history dating back to the emergence of multinational enterprises in the late 19th century. Ford Motor Company was assembling cars in Germany by procuring components from Belgium. This story has a long history. But the new phenomena of global production sharing has got two important uh, aspects. The first important aspect is the global spread of production network from mature industrial economies to developing countries. Until about the 60s, most of the uh, global production sharing occurred among developed countries. Then from about 19th, mid 60s, uh, the process started expanding to developing countries, uh, driven mainly by uh, low cost advantages. The second important point is that the product coverage has expanded to encompass a wide range of uh, products. Starting with simple electronic assembly, it has moved on to machine tool, automobiles, cameras, watches, pharmaceutical, and so many things. As I will explain later on, out of total world manufacturing trade, more than half is through global production sharing. When it comes to developing countries' manufacturing trade, that share is even bigger. That's why we can't ignore this phenomenon. Now, there have been three phases in the development of uh, global production sharing and developing countries' involvement in the process. Firstly, uh, it was simply a two-way change between the home country and the host country. To give you an example, when Lee Kuan Yew started promoting Singapore as an assembly center in electronics, uh, Fairchild uh, and uh, National Semiconductor came there to begin with in 1968. And they were doing simple stitching of some component. They were brought back to the US to be incorporated in uh, final goods. Now, the second stage is that when production bases became firmly established in developing countries, uh, component production network emerged. Say, Intel processor, uh, final assembly occur happened in Vietnam. Testing happened in Vietnam. Some of the comp high tech components come from uh, uh, Singapore, right? And again, some components come from, uh, I think, Japan uh, and the uh, other countries in the region. In other words, the second stage was 
regional component center. Finally, when production uh, component assembly became deep rooted in developed countries, multinational enterprises have started shifting final assembly uh, to developing countries. Now, China is the global final assembly center. Uh, now, uh, this is why I earlier said that it's an old encompassing phenomena incorporating component final assembly and so on. Now, here I want to highlight one important point which I'm going to support again using data. When it comes to a small country like Sri Lanka, our advantage lies in component assembly. Uh, simply because we do not have huge labor force to be used in final assembly. And China has that advantage. As I mentioned earlier, Apple Networks employ 1.2 or 1.3 million workers, right? A small country can't do it. Uh, I read about this denim producer story, even though it's not directly related. A huge denim producer came to Sri Lanka in the early 80s, and then he realized that denim is the mass production item. He couldn't find a lot of workers, uh, therefore he shifted to Bangladesh. But uh, they took our high quality technicians with them. Right? And then why this process is becoming more and more important? Uh, there are three factors. Actually, a lot has been written on this, each of these factors. Advance in, advances in technology enabling industry to slice up the value chain to finer segments, right? It is improvement in uh, production uh, engineering technology. The second point is related to that, technological innovations in communication and transportation that have contributed to significantly reduce services link cost. Service link cost is the cost involved in linking production segment located in different countries. Right? Telecommunication is vital, even uh, air trans uh, transport and all those things. Third point is that liberalization process triggered by WTO and unilateral liberalization, not by Mickey Mouse FTAs. FTAs have not contributed much. I'll discuss this later. The, this point is important, actually, even for our tariff reform. Say, uh, assembly or testing a different stage of the production process in a given country occur with a very tiny margin. Their advantage lies in volume. Therefore, even a 5% tariff can erase that profitability. Therefore, trade liberalization is a key to benefit from uh, this process. Uh, now, I will pass on to the second section of my lecture after <coughs> explaining the concept. Uh, why we should focus on global production sharing as part of export-led development strategy. I think these points are already clear to you from the two pictures I have shown. Firstly, this open up opportunities for countries to participate in a finer international division of labor, to specialize in different slices of the production process. In order to benefit from the expanded car industry, we do not have to assemble, assemble cars. We do not have competitive advantage car assembly. But as I will show you in my data later, we can specialize in small components in an automobile, right? That opportunity is provided by this phenomenon. Then the second point is very important because here we are thinking about employment generation. Government has promised to create million jobs within few years and so on. Now, in a labor abundant economy, assembly activities within global production networks tend to be relatively more labor intensive and hence pro poor. Poor people have got only one resource, which is labor. You need to create opportunity for them to sell labor if you want to eradicate poverty. To do that, you need to generate employment. And the Lincoln Global Production Network is a sure fire way of achieving that objective. And uh, we have plenty of examples. I have written about many countries in the East Asian region. The successful integration of manufacturing and export into production network uh, 
has played a key role in employment generation and poverty reduction in China and other unfortunate <coughs> countries. For Malaysia, if you plot uh, the share of uh, electronic in export and uh, employment one, on one diagram, they are 100 per, virtually 100% correlated, 0.9% correlation between the two. At the same time, if you add poverty <coughs> to the diagram, you can see a similar correlation, uh, but with a negative sign, right? Uh, export expansion, employment generation, and then poverty reduction. Now, uh, after telling this uh, general, making this general point, I'm going to highlight some specific advantages uh, related to global production sharing. Global production sharing virtually defeat the old argument against export orientation. Uh, old argument is fallacy of composition argument. That means if everybody start exporting, market will get inundated, therefore there will be a terms of trade deterioration. But here we are talking about a given product generating more opportunities. And again, new products come up in pro value uh, production chain all the time. As uh, 10 years ago, we didn't know iPad or iPod. They have come within the global uh, net, uh, production networks. The second point, as economists call it, a Schumpeterian point, uh, participating in GPN is likely to have a favorable atmospheric creation effect on manufacturing export expansion. It provides opportunities for interact with big companies, technology come into the country, and so on. Even though you don't have money to spend R&D development, uh, or maybe it is counterproductive initiative, but when you link your companies to global production network, they are exposed to a Schumpeterian environment. New products emerge, old unprofitable products go out of the sea. Then third point, open up great opportunities for achieving economies of scale. Think about producing for the domestic market, right? The, uh, your ability to expand is limited by, by the market size. But here, producing a single component for a vast global industry means you can uh, export an enormous amount compared to the size of the, your country. The best example I can give is the uh, country I have uh, studied closely, Malaysia, but specifically Penang. Penang is an island with 1.5 million workers, uh, uh, people, tiny island. But you do not know that out of total uh, semiconductor assembly in the world, about 15% come from that tiny island. Imagine you, the, you get government to promote the semiconductor industry, which you can't, uh, without having a link to global production network, can you achieve that uh, objective? Scale economies are there. The fourth point is important, actually this point is highlighted mostly in Australia because it is far away from other centers. It uh, helps overcoming tyranny of distance. That means distance is one of the biggest trade costs transport cost. But here the point is, some of the high value to weight components are now traded as air cargo. In Penang, out of total electronic export, you won't believe 80% is air cargo. Therefore, distance is not a factor. That's a lesson here. If you want to promote electronic related uh, pretext on, I think it has to be uh, closer to a vibrant airport. Uh, when I interview firms in Penang, many say that they, they have simply a good airport walking distance. Not only the value to weight ratio, but also theft. Uh, one uh, Intel factory has to send goods to the airport, it is only one kilometer. But through Chinese uh, smugglers, one smuggle, one uh, lot of uh, computer, uh, government has to <coughs> reimburse them six million dollars, right? For all these things, this fact is important. Now, uh, I'm going to relate this. This is not a criticism, but I'm adding a point uh, to the current policy debate. 
Jerry Helena, one of the prominent development economists, he wrote the first paper on global production sharing in 1973. Uh, still, it is as new as uh, <coughs> a few days ago. He had this beautiful <coughs> sentence. Interaction of the possibility of component manufacture and middle stage processing within international <coughs> industries knocks the bottom out of any state theory of development which focuses on the final product. Uh, state theory means you are moving from one product to another, as in Hausmann's uh, product space diagram. He has drawn the product space diagram at a very highly aggregated level, four-digit standard <coughs> international classification level. Then he's talking about monkey jumping from one uh, low tree to high tree. I think you can see how irrelevant that uh, uh, example in the context of global production sharing. Now, this sentence comes from their famous paper uh, published in Science. Product space, uh, it is based now. What is that? Empirically, countries move through the product space by uh, uh, developing new goods closer to those they are currently producing. In a conference in India, we were in the same panel, I asked the question, <coughs> Malaysia became an electronic exporter. Earlier, it was a rubber and palm oil exporter. Is it a monkey that jumping story? It is not, right? I mean, through in, uh, tr good trade and investment policy, they attracted multinationals to specialize in a particular segment in the production process. That is the Malaysian story. And uh, Singapore was a country based on entrepreneur trade, basically. And then uh, Lee Kuan Yew realized the importance of electronic. He had a visionary advisor, not uh, Hausman. His name is <laughs> Albert Vincemius. A Dutch gentleman. Actually, Lee Kuan Yew has said that this country was built by you, not me, right? The ideas. He identified the potential for Vietnam, uh, Singapore to join electronic network at a, at a very labor intensive segment of the production process, right? Uh, therefore, product space, the basic problem here is that product space diagram is based on the standard trade theorist. Uh, uh, assumption that countries trade in goods produced from the beginning to end in a given location. That is the concept which is becoming outdated, right? Then uh, uh, another point I want to highlight here is uh, value creation potential within global production network. Uh, people have the conception that if you get into a production network, you are going to be stuck at the very low end uh, doing simple assembly. And then they use an uh, analytical tool developed by the founder of ASA Corporation, the third biggest uh, electronic multinational uh, in the world. Uh, it's called Smile Curve. Actually, Stanshin developed Smile Curve to guide its company to design its strategy to move of the value ladder, right? They start, ESA started with a simple assembler of component for IBM computer. Then they did not want to remain in, at that level, and then they moved up market uh, at both end, product design as well as sales strategy, and it has become a multinational. But people who criticize uh, global production sharing strategy use this diagram, this is called smile diagram, uh, and interpret it wrongly. They say that you are going to be at the bottom. Uh, margins are small, you are doing simple assembly forever. It's not the case. Actually, what he said is that at that stage, ASA was at that point. Then through human capital development, R&D, and all that, it has moved in both areas. In other words, it has narrowed the smile, right? Uh, now it is involved in R and D production of component uh, after sales services and everything. Right? What the smile curve says is that in each, at the initial stage you will be doing simple assembly, but government policy in human capital development, not targeting firms or anything, developing the human capital base is vital in order to narrow the smile. Right? 
you can't keep on smiling all the time, right? With the growth process, true. Now, again, the example <coughs> come from Malaysia. Malaysia has done very well in electronic, but unfortunately, now policymakers are worried that they have not moved to product design and other things. But the reason is the government, through new economic policy, destroyed their education system. Right uh, near the electronic uh, zone, there's a co university called University of Science Malaysia. It had the potential to contribute to human capital development, but engineering faculty of that university is somewhere else because of the, uh, this uh, ethnicity-based policy. Uh, government didn't want to develop a university in that <coughs> electronic zone. And now I, I in, in, interviewed uh, Motorola, uh, advanced micro devices, Intel, and many companies, Avago, what they say is that this is a beautiful location for our um, operations, but unfortunately, we do not have high level human capital to move up. Therefore, do you know what they do? They move to Singapore, even though the wages are high, because Singapore policy is uh, crafted in a very intelligent way. They have liberalized labor inflows, all the high-level manpower, in, in, including from Sri Lanka, moved to Singapore, right? Then multinationals have uh, identified that uh, feature of the country, and they are moving back to Singapore. Therefore, with good human capital development policy, Malaysia could have done very well. Then, uh, uh, then I'll come to the third section. Some, uh, uh, okay. Uh, in this section, I'm going to come up with some data to help you to understand some of the points I have made in a deeper way. Uh, one problem with great data, and uh, uh, Hausman and others have put into, uh, got into that trap, available trade data does not permit identifying a trading part and component and final assembly. But if you work with very detailed trade data, actually you can do this disaggregation. Actually, that has been my job for about uh, five years now with uh, some research assistants. And uh, I don't want to bother you with all the technical details. Uh, you have to trust me. <coughs> uh, what we have done is use five-digit level SITC, standard uh, international trade tr data, and then carefully separated uh, the data into components, which can be done very easily because now the SATIC system is very elaborate. Then we identify final goods and divided total export into three, three, category, uh, three categories, uh, part and component, uh, final assembly, and uh, GNP product, that means uh, GPN product, uh, global network product, which are the sum of part and component of final assembly. Now, let us look at the diagrams. Now, this is the disaggregation of total manufacturing export from the world into part and component and final assembly and total GPN product. Actually, it's a typographical uh, GPN product. Now, you can see the uh, the distance between the middle blue line and the horizontal axis has been increasing continuously. And the difference between the top line and the line below has been narrowing. Uh, of course, during the global financial crisis, they are still down. But again, trade has recovered. Uh, I think it will continue to expand. Basic point here is this. Uh, in world total manufacturing export, manufacturing export account for about 95% of world merchandise trade, right? I have excluded commodities. The uh, total world manufacturing export increased from uh, about 200, uh, 2,000 million to about uh, 10,000 million during this period. Within that, uh, GPN product share has increased from 40% to 56% uh, approximately. Uh, time period is very short. I'm talking about uh, two and a half decades, right? Uh, but 
the data does not permit me to go back. If you go back to about 60s, the figures would be much more staggering. Right? The simple point here is that there has been a palpable shift in uh, world manufacturing trade away from conventional horizontal trade, which is trade uh, based on goods produced within the given location into uh, global production network trade. Then this diagram shows the share of developing countries in world manufacturing trade disaggregated into these three components, right? Uh, firstly, you have world manufacturing trade. You can see the share of developing countries in manufacturing export increased from about 12% to uh, about 57% uh, during this period. In other words, if you want to grow export, you have to rely on manufactured goods, right? Again, you can see uh, network trade, uh, the global production network trade has been the driving force. Uh, they, uh, that share has been increasing a little bit higher, pushing this share up. Now, uh, this is just a summary. You can have a look at it. Uh, by the way, the PowerPoints will be available on the IPS website for it. Uh, the two points here is GPN uh, account for uh, half of world manufacturing trade. There has been a notable shift of GNP, uh, GPN uh, trade away from developed countries and towards developing countries. Now, to put more flesh on the picture, let us look at individual country data. Now, in this table, I have compiled data, two year averages, in order to avoid uh, uh, to get a better picture, I average it for the last two years for which data are available. You can see in dynamic East Asian countries, as well as in Southeast Asian countries, uh, total GN GPN contribution is more than two thirds, right? So in China, uh, China is a relatively late starter, but again, it's a vast country producing other goods as well. But uh, out of total Chinese export, 57% is trade within networks, right? And again, uh, in ASEAN countries, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, and all that, you can get, you see, even a much bigger share. Even Vietnam, which started liberalizing reform 10, 15 years ago, now, account uh, in Vietnam, in that country, about one third of export is uh, within global network. Recently, I interviewed the vice chairman of uh, Samsung Corporation in uh, Seoul. He told me that Samsung uh, branch in uh, Hanoi employ how much? 100,000 workers and account for 14 percent of. Vietnam's total export now, right? Imagine we attract a company like that. <laughs> now again, you can see South Asia is a poor, very poor performer. Uh, in total South Asian export, uh, the share is about 28%, 2%. Sri Lanka share is tiny, 6.2. India uh, is, again, even though with all R&D capabilities, it's uh, not a big player. The, basic message here is that rapid export growth has been closely linked with their success in getting into global production network. Now, I'm going to tell a little bit story about Sri Lanka. But because up to this point, after listening to you, you might think that you are dreaming. Uh, it cannot happen in Sri Lanka. But I'm going to look at history as well as available detailed data and then try to convince you that we have missed opportunities, but still we have hope. Uh, now, the biggest uh, <coughs> policy reform in Sri Lanka during the post-independence period was the reforms initiated uh, uh, in 1977, opening up the country to foreign trade, and uh, eventually it turned out to be bipartisan policy. Nobody now talk about uh, closing the economy simply because we have gained a lot, right? Now, uh, during when the reforms were introduced in 1977, 
actually big multinationals thought that Sri, uh, Sri Lanka is an ideal location uh, for setting up assembly operations. Uh, someone has written about it. I dig dug this information uh, from the compared with past files. Uh, two big multinationals came to Sri Lanka in 1980. Motorola in 1980 incorporated a fully owned subsidiary company with an initial employment uh, of 2000 and 2,624 workers. Mohan Munasinghe, who was part of the Sri Lanka team who negotiated with the uh, Motorola, he told me that the first thing uh, uh, Mr. Douglas, the vice uh, president of Motorola, did after coming to Sri Lanka was to see a pair of the engineering faculty. Then he had said, how can this tiny faculty uh, produce enough engineers for my company? Imagine Motorola remain in the country, right? Then Harris Corporation uh, came to Sri Lanka in the same year, set up a fully owned uh, uh, subsidiary, and even it started building a factory uh, in the Katnaik Free Trade Zone uh, with an initial employment of 1,850 uh, uh, workers. Both the, these giant multinationals left Sri Lanka within few years as political instability and ethnic conflict set in, <laughs> shattering Sri Lanka's hope of becoming an electronic hub. If you want to see the Motorola story, actually uh, there's a beautiful article in Harvard Business Review, why Motorola decided to come to Sri Lanka. They, he saw, they saw all the preconditions in Sri Lanka. Uh, Mr. Chet Sin, the founding uh, chairman of uh, Penang Development Corporation, I interviewed him uh, two years ago. He was kind enough to spend me with me half a day to tell the Penang story. He said when Upali Vijayavardhana came to uh, PDC to get advice, he was very happy to advise uh, him. But when Motorola decided <coughs> to go to Sri Lanka, he said it shattered his expectation, simply because Sri Lanka is a better location for electronic assembly compared to Penang. But then Motorola left. Now I interviewed Motorola and a company two years ago, they employ 8,500 workers. And Motorola has the regional R&D hub. They don't want to do that much R&D in China, because if you do it today, tomorrow it goes to public enterprises, right? They do R&D adaptation in Penang plant, and then send it to China, right? Harris Corporation now employs about 6,000 workers. This is the missed opportunity. But it clearly shows that we had the opportunity, right? Now, have the opportunities lost? No. Uh, but a number of medium-sized joint venture firms set up mostly in the 1990s, not very recently, for assembling part and component in automobile, electronics, and electrical goods still operate in Sri Lanka. I mean, it tells the story, including uh, mm -hmm. uh, Rohan's company, right? They, it tells that uh, we have the potential. And uh, this story that wages are high, we can't do it, it's a silly argument. Say, maybe wages have increased. Our factory workers' wage is still 120th of a factory workers' wage in America uh, or Japan, right? It's not a convincing story. Now, let us look at some data. Uh, Ravin helped me to put the data, and actually we are going to write a paper based on all uh, these uh, four IPS working paper series and beyond. Now, these are the companies, some of the companies currently operating. Uh, uh, again, you can see some of the companies are 34 years old, or uh, say, Hannes Lanka, your company is 12 years, right? About 13 years old. And a few new companies have come. And again, uh, interesting thing is the uh, buoyant picture I showed you is not irrelevant to Sri Lanka. It's not irrelevant. There is one company producing harnesses for Airbus, right? And it has a planned employment of about 2,000 workers. Actually, we need to do case studies of these companies and tell the investment community that we have the potential, right? And uh, 
again, it reminds me the investment promotion campaign in Penan uh, under Lim Chong Yu, the state minister, and Chek Sin. Their investment promotion did not end at the point where when they bring a, com a, co a company to the country. They visited the company every month and got information and used this information in their investment promotion campaign. And again, successful investors who had come to the country, they took them as part of their, their investment promotion campaign. Ostrom manager told me that uh, uh, Lim Chun Yu took him to Germany. When he speak in German and tell how beautiful investment location Penang is, naturally, uh, uh, German investors uh, come to Penang. I think that strategy is not here. That's a sad thing. We need to study these companies and try to get them involved in the investment promotion campaign. Now, this data, you can see, the share is not very big, but it has not declined. That, that's the point I want to make. Other than this 10 point uh, simply, all the time, it has been around 6%. Uh, companies we started production have not left the country. It, uh, it's profitable. That's why they are here. It, again, the values have increased. Now, this is disaggregated data, not four digit, but five digit level. Now you can identify the product segment. Most of these products are in the machinery category, seven, SITC seven, right? Again, most of them are assembly activity in automobile and electronics. Uh, again, it shows, indicate the areas where we have competitive advantage in this industry. Again, when I read in the budget <coughs> speech that we want to promote automobile assembly, it gave me a shock. We can't do it. But we can promote industries like that, producing harnesses and other things. We do not have economies of scale, and we don't have a huge labor force. Uh, to, like it, in the Thailand, it's the automotive assembly center in the region. But uh, their population is big. They have open border. All the Burmese and Laos people come and work there, right? We don't have that capability. But we need to focus on component assembly. Uh, now, he's looking at me, I think. Yeah, I'll continue for <laughs> five minutes. The back. Policy options. Now, again, the prediction of standard trade theory, uh, the comparative advantage uh, theory, is factor intensity of a given product and relative price of factor inputs determine a country's uh, ability to penetrate market. Now, this prediction, actually, this theory has implication. I, mean, I still teach it, and I believe in it. But this prediction is based on the <coughs> assumption that goods are produced entirely in one location. <coughs> Inputs are trapped, but countries trade in goods. Labor is not mobile. Uh, technology is uh, not uh, mobile. Capital is not mobile. Right? Therefore, the production process is determined within the country. Now, the, the, the most important economists who have uh, written about the invalidity of this uh, for production network is uh, Ronald Jones. He has a number of papers and Peter Neary. But for some reason, economists don't listen to them simply because it makes their life harder. Because you know the tools and you can publish things by uh, based, used, uh, using them. Uh, going into new areas is a little bit uh, cumbersome. Right? <laughs> Then uh, inter-country differences in labor cost has been a significant contributor, no doubt it, right, about it, right? The production bases have shifted into developing countries in a bigger way. But differences in labor cost does not seem to explain differences among countries in their success in joining global production network. Table three again, look at this. Now look at Indonesia, which is not a big pay in production network, even though the two neighboring countries are doing well, Singapore and Malaysia. In fact, Fairchild and the National Semiconductor, when the wages started increasing in Singapore, wanted to go to Malaysia because it's closer, not to, uh, no, to Indonesia. They set up plants in 1985, but they left in 1988 simply because the investment into my 
environment was not conducive. Because of their antagonism against the Dutch colonialists, they hate foreign investments, right? Uh, and then the, again, the trade unions were very powerful. All these reasons led uh, National <laughs> Semiconductor and Fairchild to close their factories and move the other way and uh, go to Thailand and Malaysia. Then look at South Asia. The wages would be about one third of the wage, average wage of East Asian countries. Are these countries doing well? No. The labor cost is a factor, but it is not the dominant factor. Uh, what are the other determinants? Uh, in the question time, you can relate Sri Lankan experience to this. Uh, firstly, human <coughs> capital. When it comes to human capital, we are not talking about Nobel Prize winning engineers or something, right? We are talking about availability of trainable, unskilled workers, and middle-level supervisory manpower at the initial stage. In the long run, availability of high-level technical and managerial manpower is important uh, for moving uh, along the two sides of the smile curve. But it can be partly endogenous to the process. Actually, a lot of multinational which came to Penang helped the Malaysian government to set up the famous Malaysian Skill Development Center. Uh, in Sri Lanka, Motorola wanted to uh, help our engineering faculty. But of course, here government has to play a very big role. The, starting with middle level manpower, you need to develop human capital uh, base in the country. Even Adam Smith favored education, right? Education is a must. It is not an intervention. Then human capital development, do not exaggerate uh, the picture. What we need is middle rank manpower. Again, famous statement by Gokhen Sui, the visionary finance minister of Singapore come to my mind. He wrote an article in 1975. By that time, multinationals have absorbed all the labor in Singapore. And then foreigners started saying that, ah, you are a high tech country. Then Gokhen Sui said, the skill required for a girl working in an electronic firm is not no more than the skill required by a barber, right? It is lower skill, but I mean the trainable skill. You need human capital, uh, middle level manpower uh, to supplement unskilled workers to train, that's all, at the initial stage. And again, uh, President Obama had a uh, very interesting interview with uh, uh, Steve Jobs uh, a month before he died. And then Obama asked him, Steve, why don't you bring your uh, production network back to Australia? It is good for the political image of the party and the country and everything, right? Uh, at that time, uh, Intel, the Apple was employing 70,000 workers in production data at, at that time. Now it's at a single. Then he said that it is not cheap labor president, but so middle level supervisory manpower. My production network at present employing 40,000 engineers. Can you produce 40,000 engineers easily for me to employ in my production network? It is a complementary between unskilled workers and middle level manpower. Then uh, service link cost, which is important. Service link cost is the cost involved in coordinating production blocks and tasks located across countries. And uh, it is dependent on a lot of factors, infrastructure and trade-related log uh, logistics, including custom procedures and so on, political stability and policy certainty, which is the core, uh, because uh, companies involved in this process have a long-term vision. Um, if a given segment of the production get disturbed, the entire production system get disturbed, right? Then property right protection, including <laughs> enforcement of contract, liberalization of trade and investment policy regime, all these things are needed. Actually, compared to India, we are way well ahead in these areas. Infrastructure, trade relays, uh, uh, logistics, and again, uh, we have gone a long way in liberalizing trade and foreign investment regime. That's why a lot of Indian firms come and do production here, not because of the FTA, but be because of the better environment in this country. Then uh, 
I want to elaborate this point. Foreign trade and investment liberalization, in multinational enterprises are the key players. Uh, there's a close relation between foreign direct investment and trading part and component and final assembly. Now, in recent years, of course, uh, arms length trade is become, uh, has become important. When multinational come to the country and become deep rooted, they will forge link with other parties in the country. Uh, in Penang, a uh, number of local multinationals have emerged out of uh, production network. But the bulk of global production sharing takes place through inter-firm linkages within uh, multinationals rather than in an arms length trade. But there's one important point here. 30 years ago, it was basically a game of big multinationals. But over the last th three decades, what you call third world multinationals have emerged. They are basically uh, OEM producers, original equipment manufacturers for big multinationals. They are easy to bring because they are used to developing country situation. If you want to promote uh, this uh, specialization, I think you need to focus not only big multinationals, but also uh, companies coming from Singapore. Singapore companies play a very big role. Even some Malaysian uh, company <coughs> like Ink Technology, which is itself is a multinational, uh, they are much more suited to developing country environment. Then, uh, yeah. Now, in other words, trade liberalization and FDI liberalization always go together. Look at the vast difference between China and India. Uh, Indian manufacturing growth has been about 9%, closer to China. But employment potential has been dismal. Uh, people like Deepak Lal would call it is employmentless uh, growth, right? The simple reason is India that India has not got into uh, this type of specialization. Uh, but China, it liberalized certain segment of the country through special economic zones, uh, reduced tariff dramatically. Now the tariff, average tariff rate is about 5%. These have worked very well for China. China's poverty rate declined from 49% to less than 9%. And a major factor was employment in the uh, production network related industries. Again, in uh, ASEAN, Indonesia is a lagger compared to Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam now because of the uh, unfavorable investment climate. Trade regime is draconian. Uh, their custom procedures are even more draconian compared to the existing tariff, and so on. Uh, then third point, uh, the final point, is uh, market in the country uh, need for proactive targeted policy to attract foreign investors. I'm not talking about picking winners here, right? Uh, now, that's a lock-in effect in this type of activity. When the multinational come, they like to remain in a given country. Most of the multinational big ones in Penang are 40 years old now, the branch. Therefore, unless you convince them in a forceful way that's a, an alternative, they may not leave these uh, places. Then again, market failure in information. Say, the data I showed about uh, Sri Lankan company, they don't know, right? They, uh, these stories have not <coughs> been told properly. Therefore, telling these stories might help, right? The, that's an information gap that has to be part of the investment promotion campaign. Now again, evidence from Singapore, Ireland, Costa Rica, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Vietnam clearly show that Identify particular industry where you have potential and try to bring uh, foreign investors is important. Now, this quotation, uh, I think it's a little exaggeration, but it's true. Uh, this is a quotation from Paul Otellini, the CEO of Intel Corporation. He says, Barely a month goes by without some country's leader contact me and offer the like of one billion tax credit and other uh, incentives if we will open an Intel bank in that country. I'm not saying that you should waste money on this, but we tell the story. The bringing a big player 
is entirely different from bringing a tiny company. Say, Vietnam tried for 10 years to bring Intel to Ho Chi Minh City. When Intel came, all the subsidiary companies came and it built the image, big image, and now a vibrant uh, electronic hub is developing there. Say, even in the incentive debate here, people say that <coughs> you should not give incentive to any firm. I think if you can do it well to bring a big firm, I think worth doing it. It is uh, uh, something like a public good. Say, UK did it. It gave incentives to Toyota, right? Now, uh, to, uh, England car industry is the most dynamic in that region. It is not, in a way, picking <laughs> winner. Uh, uh, getting a leader to guide your future development strategy. Uh, now, I want to spend two minutes on three policy related issues. Actually, my main story is finished. But this topic, when I read the newspapers uh, over the last three days, I saw these to two topics coming again and again. The first topic, <coughs> subtopic is, <coughs> can FTAs help, right? Can FTAs promote this type of trade? Uh, what I have learned through interviews and my work uh, uh, is this. The rise of global production sharing spread the case for multilateral WTO base or unilateral rather than regional FTA approach to trade liberalization. Production sharing based international specialization can't be sustained as a regional phenomena because of the importance of extra regional or global market for final products. When uh, Lee Kuan Yew virtually cried after he was put, uh, pushed back, uh, out of the Malaysian Federation, uh, Vincent Mies told him, uh, Prime Minister, why do you think about uh, uh, your poor neighbor, Malaysia? Think globally. <coughs> Try to integrate your tiny country globally. Then in his biography, he says, that turned out to be my motto. We should not try to link, try to say we can benefit by trading with India, but that should not be the specific focus. We should not, we should integrate globally. Mr. Palliwate is exporting mostly to Japan, US, uh, and uh, he's going to start a factory in Mexico, right? It is a global economy. It is not simply India or Maldives story, right? And then uh, Victor Fun, uh, the uh, managing director of Fun and Fun, the biggest trading house in the world located in uh, Hong Kong. He has to, by the way, he's a Harvard PhD. Right? Uh, this is what he has to say. <coughs> Bilateralism distort flows of goods. In structuring the supply chain, every country of origin role and Every bilateral deal has to be tackled on an individual as individual constraints, thus constraining companies in optimizing production globally. Uh, then, then the third point here is that some you may not know this significant portion of world trade is now duty free because of the WTO Information Technology Agreement. Even India is a signatory to uh, information technology agreement. Once you sign information technology agreement, there are no tariffs on electronics, right? Electronic and related products account for about 30% of manufacturing trade. Therefore, FTA can't do anything about it. But the real story is rules of origin. FTA, the term, is a misnomer. In order to get concession even <coughs> under an FTA, we want, you want to meet rules of origin. Rules of origins can be draconian. Uh, in the PTA, uh, do you know the agreement runs into a thousand odd pages, right? 90% uh, of that is about specifying rules of origin. You give it on one hand, <laughs> then you impose all the restrictions about the eligibility. Now, when it comes to component production and assembly, the Conventional value-added rule is not applicable. You you can't meet 40 or 60 percent domestic value-added. Impossible, right? Intel manager laughed when I asked him whether he is interested in FTS, right? 
And then, therefore, you have to go for HS shifting type rules of origin. That means if you import component in one HS section, if the product belongs to an upper HS section, then you become eligible. But the irony is that most components belong to, uh, belong to the same HS6 item category. And uh, we have done work in Thailand. Uh, therefore, they are not eligible. Actually, the utilization rate of existing FTS, you all believe, is less than 10%. The politi politician like FTS because it makes headlines, uh, open up opportunities for travel and all that. <laughs> but it is a mystery all the time. Then the second point, I have got only two points, revenue implications of import tariff. Now, economists always argue that uniform tariff is better. Right? But global production sharing strengthens that argument. Simply because within a given product, there are different segments. And in, in a cascading tariff structure, intermediate goods have low or zero tariff, end product at high tariff. If you have a draconian tariff structure, then uh, with or without the involvement of custom official, I think custom official are honest, right? But there is room for manipulation. Because when different products come, you can easily ship one tariff line to another mm -hmm. and then uh, make profit, either the manufacturer, uh, importer, or the customer of the item. No. Uh, I know one story actually, Sarat Jayatilika, former uh, customer, he told me one story. Uh, government increase import duty on sewing machine. I'm not going to tell the name of the company, right? Then what the company did, uh, because import duty was 40%, it brought the machine into six part and imported, right? Because the part uh, tariff is less than 5%. Fortunately, he knew the rule. If the shipment come on one ship, you can define it as one product. And then he used that rule and charged at 45%, right? But if he didn't know that, that company is going to evade virtually all the import duties. The, but the more split the production process, the stronger the case for uniform tariff. The best example is Chile. Uh, uh, Sarat and I, we have worked with Chilean economists. Uh, this is one thing we learned from Victorio Corpo, who uh, <coughs> later became central bank governor. He was the advisor to the government. Chile has a draconian tariff structure, ranging from zero to 600. Then they uh, uh, reduced the tariff eventually, they brought most of the tariff to 5%. Do you know what the outcome? First outcome, you won't believe, tariff revenue increased. Because easy to implement the rule, there's no inducement for uh, manipulation. The second thing, an interesting thing is, the efficiency of custom procedure increased 10 times. Because now the uh, importers don't have to go and meet these people and negotiate tariff level, and they, it is, uh, I think, we have to think about uh, some uniformity in the tariffs. Of course, automobile, we can't because of various congestion problem and other things. There has to be controlled high tariff or something. But in other product areas, uh, production fragmentation make a strong case for uniformity. Then, this is the point I have been telling. Use of and abuse of value added and linkages as industry policy criteria. When you use look at the budget speed, central bank report, always say that you have to go for value-added trade, right? You have to promote linkage. But what do you mean by it's the per unit value-added? What's the percentage of retained value in the country, not the national account concept, out of a product? But the input structure within production network is relationship specific. And again, uh, companies are specializing in different slices of the product. Policy intervention aim at promoting domestic value that can be counterproductive, can run, run counter to the objective of employment generation and poverty reduction through export-oriented growth. The pertinent criteria should be volume factor. What is the market potential? Ability to produce for a vast global market and employment generation. According to the standard trade theory, the lower the value added, the higher the employment elasticity. 
simply because intermediate segments are relatively more capital intensive. But it does not mean that with, when the production system becomes deep rooted in the country, there can be some improvement. Say in ready-made garment industry, retained value was 20% begin with. Now it has increased. It can happen. But all over the world, value addition per unit is declining. Right? Uh, contribution to national output depends on the volume factor, not on per unit value added. Therefore, advocating per unit value added as a policy criteria is not consistent with. Actually, Hirschman in his book, he has a beautiful footnote. He says, I introduced this concept for import competition era. We ignore efficiency. We want to maximize growth potential within the national boundaries. That is fine. Then our people who studied the uh, strategy of economic growth, uh, 1968 book, still advocate that policy to the globalized world, which is uh, misleading. Now I come to the last slide, uh, concluding remarks. International trade is no longer the change of wine flow clause, as we have studied in uh, second year international economics. With rapid expansion of global production sharing, conventional approach to trade flow analysis, which attributes uh, trade to exchange of as exchange of goods within national boundaries, is losing its relevance. Uh, again, Pascal Lamy, the former director general of WTO, had this statement: "This phenomena calls for a change in analytical and statistical tool." we use to measure and understand the real world. Then global production sharing has been the prime move of dramatic shift in manufacturing and export from developed to developing countries. Thirdly, the expansion of global production sharing <coughs> has made input and capital increasingly mobile across national boundaries, and hence the pattern of production and trade has become more sensitive to overall investment climate of the country. The role of government is to create an enabling environment. The government has the potential to focus on specific industries if, if they are suitable for your country. Right? Uh, Lee Kuan Yew wanted to promote employment, and he focused on electronics. In his two-volume biography, there's a, no single mention in about value. Right? And then, but promoting individual firms to specialize in specific <coughs> tasks within GN, GPN is beyond the capability of the government. It is the role of the entrepreneur to discuss. I'll stop at that point. Thank you.